friends in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want to review a little bit from your confirmation days. I want to remind you of the explanation that Luther wrote to the very first article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean, Martin Luther asked, and he explained, I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still preserves them, that he richly and daily provides me with food and clothing, home and family, property and goods, and all that I need to support this body and life. That he protects me from all danger, he guards and keeps me from all evil, and all this purely out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me, for all which I am in duty bound to thank and to praise, to serve and obey him, this is most certainly true. The explanation to the first article of the Creed. What is God Almighty? What is God Almighty doing for you today? Even right now? Well, according to that explanation, He is preserving your body and your abilities. He is richly and daily providing you with all of the stuff that you need to live. He protects you. He is guarding you and keeping you from all evil and danger. And he even admits there that you aren't worthy of these things. You haven't done anything to deserve them. But he is going to give you these things anyway. In fact, he has promised them to you. He is guaranteed to give these things to you. And he constantly reassures us of their certainty. And we believe that God is truthful, don't we? He has to keep his word, otherwise he wouldn't be God, would he? But dear friends, in spite of these great promises, in spite of these guarantees from God Almighty, what happens? We still doubt. We still worry about things. We still stress out about things. We are anxious about all aspects of our earthly lives, it seems. Beyond that, we look at what other people have, and we covet. We want more and more. We let jealousy so often get the better of us when we look at others around us and we determine for ourselves that we want what they have. And so what happens so often, we dedicate ourselves and our whole being to keeping up with the Joneses, as the expression goes. There's a popular radio show host out there who talks about your personal finances. He tries to help people get out of debt. And one of his catchphrases is, why do you want to keep up with the Joneses? They're broke. Of course, he's referring to, to the debt that they have accumulated and to the pointless financial waste in, in getting all of these things. But his saying also rings true on a much deeper level. And it causes me to ask, you, Christians, why do you want to keep up with the Joneses? They're broke. They are spiritually broke. People such as this who seek after more and more stuff, they, they end up selling God down the river. They have little use for his preservation, for his help. They have little use for what God will provide. They have little use of his protection from danger and evil. And yet it still remains. In spite of how much a person might have, they could still be spiritually broke and broken, lacking true and lasting peace. Dear friends, the only way to have true and lasting peace, to not worry, to not be stressed out, to not be anxious about things, is to turn back and remind yourself of what we confess in that first article of the Creed. We confess and we believe that God cares about us. We confess and believe 
that God preserves our lives. We confess and believe that He provides everything that we need in order to get by and survive. And He does so richly, doesn't He? He also has promised to protect, to guard, and keep us from all dangers and from all evils. <coughs> now I ask you, do you believe that? After all, that's what our almighty, all-powerful God has told us. This is an important truth that we want to hold on to every single day of our lives. We want to commit ourselves to God and to His care. Trust that He is going to make sure that in spite of any troubles or difficulties that might pop up in your life, He is going to see you through those things. As Jesus encourages us and reassures us in our text this morning, don't worry. Instead, be happy, be content in your life, because God is for us. He emphasizes this truth in our text, which is taken from Matthew chapter 6. This morning we're going to consider verses 24 through 34. And you can follow along in your bulletins on page 5. Please rise as we hear these words. In Jesus' name. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We pray. These are your words, heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. Now, dear friends, just before our text begins, Jesus was teaching about material possessions. He was teaching about the things that we have. And his point was to not let such mammon, that is, the stuff, the things of this world that ultimately are going to fade away and come to nothing, don't let such mammon, he says, take top billing in your hearts. But instead, make use of these things that you have been given by God. Make use of these things in being charitable and in helping other people. Take what you have and invest it in eternity, Jesus teaches. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, he says. Or as we spoke a few Sundays ago, take your unrighteous wealth and make heavenly friends for yourselves by using what you have to God's glory. God has generously given earthly things to us not so that we can set a new, higher standard of living, but so that we might increase our standard of giving. Not being selfish, but instead he wants us to be charitable, to show love to one another. 
Jesus summarized all of this in the opening verse of our text. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or as the King James Version goes, or mammon. Jesus is encouraging us to be generous and charitable. Things that we've been talking about these past five weeks. To show love for our neighbors. But still, we struggle to put this into practice, don't we? Why? Is it because of fear? Is it because of worry? Jesus understands that we are weak Creatures, and that we struggle with fear and worry about where things are going to come from. Which is why he approaches us with such beautiful words as we find in our text. He says, oh you of little faith, look around you. Why are you anxious? Why are you worried? Why are you not putting into practice these, these things that I have been teaching you about being charitable or loving? Why do you stress out? Look at the birds of the air. Look how God feeds them. Look at the beautiful flowers of the field, how God clothes them with such great beauty. And just think how much more valuable you are than these things. When Martin Luther preached his sermon on this same text, he called the birds and the flowers around us little preachers. They preach to us. He scolded his parishioners, saying, Shame on you and your loathsome unbelief. Look at the bird. Early in the morning it rises and it sits upon a twig and it sings a song it has learned. It doesn't worry. It's not anxious about where it will find its breakfast. But then when it is hungry, it flies away. It seeks a grain of corn where God has stored one away for it. Yes, shame on you now that the little birds are more pious and believing than you. They are happy, they sing with joy, and they do not know whether they even have anything to eat. Or think of the lilies of the field, Luther points out. They're more beautiful than King Solomon in all of his glory with his fine purple robes, with all of his gold and jewels. And yet these flowers of the field, he says, are devoured by cows. They're trampled underfoot. And still the flower stands and as we look at it, it confesses and professes to us. It says, look at me, I am fresh and beautiful as God has made me. And I serve the true and righteous God. Do you? In our text, Jesus tells us to look at these examples and to realize how, how much more than birds and flowers, how much more God loves us. Far more important to God is the pinnacle of his creation, that to which he gave an immortal soul, the human race, not for flowers or birds, but it was for fallen mankind, that God stepped off of his throne in heaven and took on human flesh and blood in the person of Jesus Christ, not for flowers or birds, but for us. He became our brother in order to help us. He came into this world. He lived a holy, perfect life, a life of perfect love and charity. He lived the life that God wanted us to live. He lived it for us in our place because we failed to live it. Also in our place, Jesus went. He suffered. He died upon the cross. He died the death that we sinners deserved. He was nailed to the cross of Calvary because of us, because of our sins. There he paid the price for all of our crimes. Not for birds or flowers, but for us. And it didn't end there, of course. But for us and for our justification, Jesus rose to new life on Easter morning. And with that open and empty tomb, he shows the whole world that his victory over sin and death is complete. And that we are victorious over death as well. 
Dear friends, not for birds or flowers, but for us. What wondrous love is this that, that God has shown us in the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus. No greater love has ever been shown than this love that God has shown to you, which forgives you of your sins, which hands to you salvation and eternal life. When you struggle with your doubts, when you struggle with your daily stresses and daily anxieties and worries, when they come pressing down upon you, do as Jesus directs and look at the birds. Go and look at some flowers of the field. See how lovingly God provides for them. And then look at the cross of Jesus. Remind yourself how much more God loves you. Remind yourself of your baptism, where God washed your sins away and sealed you with his own name. Remember the Lord's Supper that you come up here and receive, the very body and blood of our Savior, Jesus. Remember the word that God is preaching into your ears here in this place, not for birds or flowers, but for you, because he loves you. If he has given you all of these things, if Jesus was willing to come into this world to, to live, suffer, and die in your place, well then he's certainly going to make sure that you are provided with all that you need to support your body and life. He's going to make sure that you are protected from all danger, that you are guarded and kept from all evil. Dear friends, in this section, Jesus is really challenging you. He is challenging you to entrust yourself fully every single day to God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all of these other lesser important things, they're just going to fall into place, he says. They will be added to you as well. And so don't worry. You can be happy, you can be content in your life, because you know that God is for you. God loves you, and he wants and will give always what is best for you. All glory be to him. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat> the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now by joining together in singing our offertory, which is found on the bottom of page 5 of our bulletins. 